The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Dealing with fear is kind of a general topic, and uh, but I feel like it's extremely important at this point in time. Uh, I was looking at that scripture in Exodus, and I was reminded uh, in Exodus 10, 21, it talks about when the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there might be darkness over the land of Egypt. Of course, Egypt was in darkness spiritually, but now it actually happened. But it says, darkness which may even be felt. Darkness has to have fear in it. It's the kingdom of darkness. It's the kingdom of fear. There's, fear is inevitable. Uh, I always said uh, fear was like a two-headed dragon because it always reminded me of how even it's not fair. He'll even deal with little children. There'll be some kind of a disturbance in the house, maybe mom and dad are fighting or something, and the kid goes, runs in the closet. That demon of fear will say, you're safe in here. It promises safety. When logically, it might be safer in the closet than out in the living room where mom and dad are having a knockdown drag out perhaps, but at the same time, you buy into fear as a spirit. You buy into it. And, uh, it's like a two-headed dragon. There's fear and then uh, fear some more. Uh, you're afraid while you hide in the prison of fear, but you're more afraid to come out. And that really has to transpire. When Jennifer and I got married, Jennifer had for 20-some years, I don't know how, or maybe longer, uh, a tachycardia where she had uh, difficulty. Uh, all of a sudden, her heart would start palpitating fast. And one night we were lying in bed. We were probably married about a matter of months, I guess. And uh, all of a sudden, the bedroom flooded with a spirit of fear. Then I could feel it coming from Jennifer. So I'm going, it's in the room, but it's coming from Jennifer. That's discerning the human spirit. And so I, I poked her. I said, Jennifer, what's going on? She goes, I'm having one of those, one of those attacks. And I said, all right, we're going to deal with this. She knew to drop down. I said, drop down. You feel it inside of you? And she goes, yes. Then receive forgiveness for taking in something God didn't give you. You know, we, we've got to really got to learn this stuff, church, because I'm hearing all kinds of crazy stuff from church people. Like, uh, you know, well, you just got to live with it. And, you know, uh, and then they enjoy people commiserating with them rather than getting healed. 365 times, that's once for every day of the week, God says, fear not. So if he's saying fear not, I'd rather obey the word and believe him. And by the way, do you believe there's something too big for God? Because I've seen people form their theology based on their bad experience. Well, if your bad experience is you don't have much victory, don't blame God on that. Find out why you don't have much victory, rather than cause it to become your theology. Uh, I, I've seen people that uh, because they never experienced any kind of freedom, they automatically assume you have to live with it, and this, and then they put it on other people. But then they find this kind of false comfort, this two-headed dragon, with other people in the same situation, and you find, uh, and you'd rather have that than get delivered. And I'm saying there's a clarion call right now to the church. You better deal with fear because darkness is getting darker. Light's supposed to get lighter. And uh, all, all toxic emotions, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, are from hell. And a spirit of fear is the hideous, hideous demon. Fear is insidious. It, it's the enemy of your soul. It's a destiny destroyer. It's an evil jailer. And it keeps telling you, even for little children, what's it tell you? What's, what's that little child hiding in the closet doing? You're safe. You're safe. You're safe in prison. And you can get so convinced 
that fear is keeping you safe, that you're afraid to come out. Uh, I remember in Mexico, a team of us, uh, five pastors, all senior pastors, and we went to Mexico to minister in the church, and the pastor there was beside himself because he had a woman who uh, the parents kept calling and saying, uh, their daughter, uh, she had backslid, gone out on the streets, prostitution, got pregnant, had a baby, but then she confined herself to one room, probably thought it was safe from all the shame. She was in that one room with the baby, and naturally the parents were concerned, going, I don't know if the baby's being fed properly. We don't know. She won't come out of that room. She's in a prison of her own making. But it's a demonic spirit. Well, I saw this woman when we were in Mexico, and her eyes were as black as two pieces of coal. No shine at all. It was demonic. And we got her to forgive herself for her behavior. Simple forgiveness, but from the heart. The eyes went natural, and she got free. But here's the thing. Her freedom was kind of progressive. But I don't care if it's instant or progressive, because nowadays people are buying into trauma that you just have to live with trauma. Trauma would be a more severe form of fear. But whether the fear is simple and can be dealt with instantly or is progressive, you have an obligation to progress. Deal with it progressively then. Because uh, to just say, I have to live with it, is not scriptural. You're saying something's bigger than God. And uh, I don't know, you're going to have to argue real well with scripture because the, the, the scripture says, I sought the Lord, he heard me, and he delivered me from all of my fears. Gee, I wonder what all means in the Hebrew. Probably all. And isn't it true? We, we know in the New Testament, perfect love casts out fear. So we should be looking to perfect love for the solution, not, oh, I guess you got to live with it because that's been my experience. We've got to start getting experiencing a little bit more Jesus. Uh, you know, uh, fear of man is a snare, isn't it? And that means even your own self-appraisal that produced and received the fear. The fear of man, it's a snare, it's a trap, it's a jail. And I believe that God in these days is going to cause us to shine like an luminous star. Of course, that's Jennifer. I always tell you, Jennifer, she shines like an luminous star. Well, I think we need to let our, this little light of mine, we ought to let it shine, don't you think? If, the chil if it's good enough for children, then maybe we ought to be a little more childlike and let that light shine because light dispels darkness. Darkness can't comprehend it. Darkness can't extinguish it. Darkness can't overcome it. So at some point, but uh, trauma uh, is a response. Let's talk about trauma because when I was a very young pastor, I saw abuse and I dealt with a lot of people that were abused and they got quality ministry. However, I also saw a tendency for if somebody burnt your toast, you know, they're abusing you. I saw that while that word was prevalent and necessary and serious, there are other people abusing that word. I see people using abusing that word now, not just abuse, you know. Now, now the abuse comes on the form of, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I need a safe space. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you know what? that's a closet, and I know who's in charge of that. I know who the jailer is, <laughs> you know. And uh, but. Trauma is very real, very serious, and I've dealt with people. I, I prayed for one lady in my church and saw her be delivered out of the fetal position in the psychiatric ward. She came out of it. So I've seen the extreme. But don't use trauma for every little owie. What a bunch of snowflake Christians sometimes, you know? Oh, I was traumatized. What happened? Oh, the, the vacuum cleaner quit working. Yeah. Uh, you might have been upset. You might have even been afraid. What do I do now? I don't have money to buy another one. But that's not a trauma. Let me give you, a, there is legitimate trauma, and we need to know how to minister to it. But guess what? Even that is not too big for God, is it? So whether it's a little fear or a trauma, whether you get instant deliverance or you get progressive. That lady in Mexico, by the way, she got instantly clear-eyed, but it was still a progressive 
uh, I guess uh, what the, they call it psychology, uh, agoraphobia, but it was spiritual. What she had to do is she, the victory, right after she received forgiveness for her behavior and the fact that she got pregnant uh, as a prostitute, the first thing she did when she came out of that room, which was step one, out of the jail, out of the prison, forgiveness set her free. Forgiving herself set her free. She received forgiveness. She handed the baby to her mother. That's another step. She started going into other rooms in the house but wouldn't leave the house. Eventually, over a period of time, she sought the Lord. She had been a Christian and backslid, but she was seeking the Lord. She eventually got to the point where, guess what? She went outside. And then the pastor called us, uh, I think it was like three months later. Three months. But so what? That's a small price to pay, isn't it? We got people who couldn't even do a 60-day challenge. Uh, that's for somebody else. That ain't for me. I that's too much of a challenge, 60 days. Oh, man. Two months out of your life. And uh, the pastor from Mexico called and said, she's back in church. So the same way she isolated herself was a progressive way of coming out of it. And I think that's indicative of the way we should be praying in some of these situations. If you don't get instant victory, don't say that God isn't able. Don't say it's too big for God. And don't say I've got to live with it. All right? No. Uh, the common uh, uh, trauma is a deeply distressing and disturbing. It's real. It's powerful. It's an event that over, overwhelms an individual's ability to cope, and it causes uh, feelings of helplessness. Like, I have no more choices. It's like helpless. Helpless means I have to stay in this constant state of helplessness and hopelessness. It diminishes their sense of self and the ability to feel a full range of emotions and experiences. It it's defined more by the person's response than the trigger. You know, something triggered it. One or more events triggered it. By one or more events, one event probably triggered it sufficiently, and then it was fortified by that trigger going off over a period of time. And, but it's, uh, here's some of the common responses to traumatic events very significantly among people. But there are some basic common symptoms. Uh, the emotional signs include sadness, anger, denial, fear, and shame. And in the case of the woman in Mexico, it was primarily what I saw was the shame. She knew that what she had done. And then she had a consequence by have, getting pregnant and having a baby. It was a consequence of what she had done. And that's where she had to see. When Jesus forgives, he releases and he frees. And he can he can cleanse and make you, though your sins are as scarlet, he can make you white as snow. It's your responsibility to apply. Now, uh, they can lead to, and this is common when I've dealt with people with this, uh, nightmares, insomnia, difficulty with relationships in general, emotional outbursts, You can tell there's a root to something when the outburst is far larger than the stimulus. <laughs> you know, like if Jennifer made me chicken and I went, Chicken! I can't stand chicken! Why are you doing chicken? You know, and care, it would be some kind of a drama about not liking something. Apparently, the issue is probably not chicken. It's probably something that was in Dennis prior to the trigger. And if I think about triggers, anything. I, I dealt with a guy who was a cocaine addict, and all he had to do uh, that triggered it for him was he quit smoking. And as, as, as soon as he saw a pack of cigarettes, it was enough to trigger because he, he, he was having a bad day. He started smoking. As soon as he smoked, he went back to the cocaine. So who knows what the trigger is? Now... The common physical symptoms, oh, by the way, you know, if we could see the toll that fear takes on the physical body, we would really seek the Lord to get free from it. 
instead of saying, this is the way I am, I've always been like this, da 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 all those excuses. But uh, nausea, dizziness, altered sleep patterns, changes in appetite, headaches, gastrointestinal problems, the psychological disorder, and uh, PTSD. We even have a booklet. Well, they changed it to, it's, that's the way we've heard it for years, but it's PDSI. It's called a post-traumatic stress injury now instead of that's just the way the psychology manuals go. You know, when they want to change a word, they change a word. But PTSD or PDSI, um, depression, anxiety, uh, dissociative disorders, substance abuse and problems. All, all This is just some of the, the common things. But I want to tell you something. We had an African bishop... Uh, when we did down in Birmingham, Alabama, I believe we were in, wasn't it? Or Montgomery, Alabama, one of those cities. And we were doing a seminar, and an African bishop who had hundreds of churches under him uh, came to the seminar, and within one meeting, he gave the best definition of what Jennifer and I were trying to do. <laughs> Apparently, we must have been doing it at some level, because he defined it better than anyone has ever defined it. And this, this was what he wrote about Dennis and Jennifer's teaching. He said, from the initial encounter with Jesus, like born again, from the initial encounter with Jesus and the process of relationship with him that follows, doctors Dennis and Jennifer have documented, Jennifer mostly, have documented a step-by-step -step process that combines God encounter with the process of relationship. God encounter plus relationship. God encounter plus relationship. And guess what? That's progressive. So I think it's about time that we, we allow God to wash ourselves from all of our excuses of, oh, that's just the way I am, or I've always been like that. Well, maybe it's time to sit there and say, you know what? Let's, let's, let's be aware of the time that we're living in here, and let's get past that. And whether it's instant or progressive, no. The, there's at least seven uh, fear things, but I want to make sure you're getting some ministry this morning. And there's uh, people watching, and you can, you can get ministry right, you're, right where you're at, because the first thing you can do, just like that woman did, I didn't, pow, come on out of her. I had her go to the Jesus in her and receive forgiveness, and the deliverance came. You as believers have the ability, you have the authority, if you would just use it properly. Repentance and forgiveness is a beautiful gift. It's a work of the cross. All of this is a work of the cross. And if you want to shun the cross, then you expect someone else to do it for you. Now, and even if they do it for you, without your cooperation, you won't see results. God's not going to violate your will. If you don't want to, you don't have to do anything. Now, uh, in these three areas, uh, there's seven all together, but I, I want to cover this so we can get some, make sure we get some prayer. The first one is the unknowable. The second one is the uncontrollable. And the third one is the unattainable. Two T's. <laughs> I think I did one. But Oh, well, you should correct the spelling. Um, the, the fear of these three things attack your soul. What do I mean by, when I use the term soul, what are we talking about? Mind, will, and emotions. Mind, will, and emotions. And fear attacks all three. 
but it can, it can emphasize one more than the other. The unknowable attacks the mind. The uncontrollable attacks the will, and the unattainable attacks the emotion. And what's interesting is, remember we talked about, and there was darkness in Egypt, so dark, so dark it could be felt. That's the manifestation on the mind is darkness. And the solution is what? What shined in the darkness? Light. So you need the light of God's revelation. Anything God's speaking to you in the scriptures, anything that's kind of even quickened to you, if you would just let it shine upon your heart, you'd be changed from glory to glory. If you just honored him enough to not say, hmm, that's interesting. Mm, that's a, it's, not about, it's not about knowing something in your mind. It's about having that mind lit. <laughs> Lights need to come in the darkness because I've watched people struggle to figure something out and go down the tubes. Literally, I had a nervous breakdown because they were going to figure it out. That doesn't include God figuring it out. Even God says, come, let us reason together. You want to reason? Reason with him based on his word, not you figuring it out. Until that's broken, some people live in a fear of not knowing. Guess what? There's some things you're never going to know. <laughs> and you weren't meant to know. And yet there are other things that God says, if you would pursue me and seek me, you will find me and you will search for me with all your heart. So there's things I want to reveal to you. The uncontrollable, the fear of the uncontrollable, that affects the will, it manifests as control. You take matters into your own hands. If I don't do it, it won't get done. All of that kind of stuff. But that will manifests as control. And that's dead works and you're actually operating independent of God. And what is God's solution? Life. Light. Life. Life, what do I mean by life? Uh, scripturally, uh, the law of the spirit of life makes me free from the law of sin and death. There's a freedom by being under his control, not trying to fix everything and be a controller. So fear hits and will use all three of these in varying degrees in any Christian's life if they're not going to submit to light, find out what God is saying, not you figuring it out, not your opinion, find out where you're in control and let God control through his life. He wants to live his life. It is no longer I who live. It is God who is at work in me to will and to perform. That's his life working through you. And then lastly, the emotions, they manifest primarily as failure. I can't do it. I'm a failure. I've always been like this. <laughs> no, not really. Just your opinion. But love never fails. Light, life, and love. People should memorize those because that's God. That's the way God works on your soul. He wants to bring you life. His life is the light of men. And his love is his very essence, his nature. Now, okay, I want to I give you something here. I think I can do this pretty fast. So I'm going to zip through this. You will not be able to take notes. <laughs> but I do have a very poorly drawn example. All right. I was a baby Christian, and God put me in the probably only one of two trances that I was ever in. I mean a literally spiritual trance where God told me to plant a church, and I said, I don't know how. How do you do that? I have a tendency to ask God, how do you do that? And he gave me a vision. Actually, this was staring at a three-pane glass uh, window in a person's house. And it was stained glass, but it, you know, and this was kind of like the sill uh, under the dome glass. And here's what God said. Now, I'm going to go real fast here, so this is not the important part. We're going to deal with fear, right? All right. But here's the thing. This dome has a cross on the top, and the foundation, 
was Jesus himself. You can't build on any other foundation other than intimacy with Jesus, correct? You know that from Scripture. So he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end, and everything in between depends on him. Now, Jesus, there was no other foundation. The second thing God says, as a young pastor, you're going to teach them. You're going to teach them intimacy with God and Jesus as a foundation, and it better be real. It's not about religion. Second foundation, you're going to walk with me in such a way that I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit. I'm going to take you, Dennis, to the school of the Spirit, and I'm going to teach you the foundational principles because what God says, I'm going to build my church, not you. I'm going to build my church, but I build according to patterns based on principles. So here was the foundation of patterns and principles. What's that like? Like sowing and reaping. That's a pattern and a principle. He doesn't ever do away with that. And the Beatitudes. God says, I'm going to show you not just the foundation of reality in him. I'm going to teach you his ways. Then I'm going to take you to Hebrews. And this is kind of a basics course in the beginning. Uh, the foundational teachings of Jesus. Gee, if they're called the foundational teachings, I think we should know them. Hebrews 6, repentant from dead work, faith toward God. All right? If they're called elementary or foundational, I think we should have a pretty good working knowledge of those so that we can move on to maturity. Then he says, I'm taking you to the foundation of apostles and prophets to build upon leadership and understanding the assembly. And by the way, did you notice if this was a representation of the church, individual, me and you, and corporately, that leadership is on the bottom. It's not a top-down thing. It's on the bottom. And then he says, priority number one, number two, and number three. Priority number one is worship in the Word. Isn't that pretty generic? That, this would work for anybody's church if they really wanted to apply themselves. It's just principles right? Worship in the word, but with reality. They that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, not a bunch of religion where I read my Bible, I went to church, right? Reality is the priority. Your worship in your word has to be in reality, in spirit and in truth. That's relational. And if it is real, what's going to happen is you're going to have changed lives, transformation. And priority three is you won't just be evangelizing your changed life, you will be demonstrating it. And out of the base of the temple will flow rivers of living water. Okay, that's not the part I wanted to talk about, though. He showed me in this dome the four characteristics, love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And we're doing that on Tuesday night, by the way. What he said was, I want you to create an atmosphere. And you don't create an atmosphere unless you get out of the way and let God's atmosphere flow out. And we do have this on Tuesday night. And that atmosphere is love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace. But here's the, the beautiful part. We're going to attack the next four elements of fear. I think I'm doing this fast enough. We're going to get this covered today. But I'll go slow. <laughs> Jennifer always goes. Slow. Okay. All right. Number one. Now, we already covered the first three, uh, the fear of the unknowable, the uncontrollable, and the unattainable. Okay, those fear. And that's the way it attacks your soul. And it can be all three of those or one specifically. The fourth one is fear of failure. Fear of failure, we called it the, in the earlier teaching, the performance trap. And here's the lie that's embedded if you're going to need deliverance from that fear. The fear of failure to be delivered, you've got to get delivered from the lie. I must perform to a certain standard to feel good about myself. You're no longer performing for God. You're doing works that you feel good about yourself. But guess what? It's not all about you. <laughs> and you start messing with a standard other than the cross of Jesus Christ is something you came up with. That's even more dangerous. That's another gospel. You came up with your own standard. And the one who struggles with the performance traps, they have a fear of failure. 
perfectionism. Sometimes they want to perform to manipulate others so they can achieve success. And they can also cowardly withdraw from healthy risks. Won't risk anything because what would happen? I could fail. That would be the end of the world. You know, uh, one of my friends when I was a young pastor he used to say, fail, but don't be a failure. <laughs> Learn from it. Get yourself up and then do what's right. Micah 7. Now, this fear of failure, this perfectionism, withdrawing from healthy risk is a performance trap. And what's interesting is that God, through the cross, up here, gave a solution. And that solution is justification. The fear of failure and justification, just as if, in other words, you are completely and fully loved. You didn't do anything for it. You were justified by faith. It was a, you were saved. By faith, it was a gift. But if you want to perform to earn it somehow, you enter into another standard. Now, the second performance trap, the approval addict. The first one was a fear of failure. Fear of failure. The second one is the fear of rejection. People that are caught up in the fear of rejection have a lie that has to be dealt with. And what they're saying is, I must have the approval of certain people in order for me to feel good about myself. And in some cases, that even involves putting out somebody else's light, thinking that makes you shine brighter. And approval. They have to, I have to be seen and heard. The approval addict fears rejection and is oversensitive to criticism. And they will withdraw from people to avoid disapproval. But what did God do through the cross to deal with that fear of failure? Justification. Just as if you never sinned. He loves you that much. Secondly, the fear of rejection, the approval addict. I must have the approval of certain people to feel good about me. That lie has to come down. And God's answer to this false belief is reconciliation. And what does that mean? And all of these need to be prayed through out of a relationship with God. Because reconciliation for me was I only knew rejection my whole life. But when I prayed and I got God's acceptance and it was a light that shined on my heart and it was reality and it was written on my heart, that supernatural acceptance exceeds anything you could ever get from people, places, or things. It's real and you own it. I am accepted in the beloved. I'm a one of a kind. There never was another me. There never will be another me. That's when reconciliation takes place. And uh, it means that although one time I was hostile toward God and alienated, uh, nevertheless, I have now been forgiven and brought into an intimate relationship with him. Consequently, I am totally accepted by God. Wow. Justification means I am totally, totally Loved, now I'm totally accepted. Then the third one. And this one we saw as a very necessary one. The blame game. That, that gets kind of weary. Uh, I know you phone coaches probably run into it all the time. The people that really don't want to go to the cross and get deliverance or get healing and let repentance and forgiveness do its work, they want to say, I'm calling to tell you how this other person hurt me. 
and they need the change. <laughs> That's the blame game, and supposedly that was done away with when you got saved. Supposedly, you're not supposed to practice the blame game anymore. The blame game, you are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth, and you therefore should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth. Doesn't mean you have been reconciled. Doesn't mean you don't establish boundaries. But you, you definitely need to know the blame game is history. And here's the way the lie works for the people in the blame game, those that have struggled with rejection. Those who fail, including myself, are unworthy of love and deserve to be punished. I've seen people locked into that punishment thing. They want revenge so bad they're demonic, extremely demonic, because revenge is feeding their flesh a, a, an unhealthy energy, and they like it. You know, Light has come into the world, but people love darkness because their deeds were evil. All right, what did God provide for this under the work of the cross? Propitiation. The fear of punishment. The blame game is the fear of punishment. Those who suffer from the blame game fear punishment, and they also try to punish others. And their drive is to avoid failure. And God's answer was propitiation. God's answer was forgiveness, which means that by his death on the cross, he satisfied the wrath. You know, when he died on the cross, we say he takes, took our sin. He took your punishment for the sin. That's important to see that. He took the punishment. He took the stripes. He took the punishment for your sin. So you punishing yourself or punishing other people are operating out of a different gospel. And it's the enemy. It's the kingdom of fear is where it's coming from. Everything in the kingdom of the devil is fear. It's fear-based. Now, I am fully forgiven. The fear of punishment these, are, these four elements, justification, reconciliation, propitiation, and lastly, regeneration, those are just biblical words of the work of the cross and how it impacted all of us. But here was the beauty. God gave me this atmosphere of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And when he got to regeneration, that's shame. Well, I got one of my most beautiful healings on shame. I was a, a called to preach. Someone asked me to give my testimony. I walked up to the pulpit, and shame covered me, and I walked off, and the worship leader had to give her testimony. <laughs> I had to fill the time spot. Dennis walked off the stage. What are we going to do? And I went home, and I knelt down by the side of a couch, and I said, God, what's wrong with me? And the first thing he showed me was that I was like nine years old and a bedwetter. And I was so ashamed of myself. It was like my little secret until I found out uh, Jimmy Hansen next door. He went to bed, too, and he was about eight. And so I had a friend to commiserate, but then he got mad in the middle of a baseball game and said, and, and his older brother said, yeah, well, you still went to bed. He goes, well, so does Dennis Clark. <laughs> so, But I'm kneeling there. And God showed me that I had like a slimy stocking mask. And I saw myself as a nine-year-old with clenched fists lying in bed hating myself, ashamed of myself, probably like that woman in Mexico, not like that prostitute woman. Hate yourself. And you're ashamed. And I'm like this. And then it was, well, I'm just a young Christian now. And God says, well, it's wrong to hate yourself. It's wrong to hate anybody. Okay, I receive forgiveness. And when I receive forgiveness, the shame was a demonic spirit. The shame lifted off. You imagine how powerful that shame spirit was that it got me to walk off that stage as a born-again, spirit-filled believer. It can do that. It's, these things are powerful, but they're all fear-based, and they've got to be dealt with. And... 
that shame was the fear of incompetence. I walked off the stage because I really believed that I don't deserve to be up here. I'm not good enough. That's what shame will do. But that ain't God. If God says, I made you to preach, <laughs> why would you want to argue with your own personal evaluation of the way you see yourself? You know, the, uh, the, the fear is of incompetence. That's why it's like other ones. You, you'll be afraid you'll withdraw from even, even not too scary risks just to not... But those who suffer from shame are marked by feelings of hopelessness. Hopeless, helpless, uh, inferiority, passivity, loss of creativity. And there we go again. This is what fear loves to do. Isolation. Withdrawal from other people. This gets so old that, you know, even just a superficial study of this should, should indicate. But I'll tell you what I was thrilled with. That when God says that fear of incompetence, he said the answer for it was grace and regeneration. Justification, reconciliation, propitiation, and regeneration are all fancy theological names for the work of the cross. And this fear of incompetence so we have fear of failure, fear of rejection, <clears throat> fear of punishment, and fear of incompetence. And here's the beautiful part. The end result, the scriptural response, and this is like I started on here with the Alpha and Jesus is no other foundation up to the work of the cross. It just happened, and I found this after I was already pastoring, before I even paid any attention to this. Justification is that you are totally loved by God. Reconciliation for rejection, you are totally accepted by God. Forgiveness, propitiation, you are totally forgiven fully accepted, totally forgiven, fully accepted, deeply and completely loved. And for shame, I am what I am by the grace of God, and it's grace is the empowerment that I need so that I don't get into dead works. Grace, which means we place our faith in Christ, and grace is his ability to not sin. Grace is his empowerment to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. But that was the excitement for me when I saw what God had told me as a baby Christian. And by the way, I, my first pastorate, I ended up building a dome church, not that you needed it, but it was like this was so part and parcel to the people that when we built the dome church, it was like a reminder of the basic vision. But this basic vision is generic. Anybody's church should be able to do that. Jesus should be the foundation, duh. Patterns and principles, you learn the ways of God, learn the foundational teachings from the scripture, appreciate the fact that God builds according to a structure and a promise, and he's built on the foundation of, these are all foundations on the apostles and prophets, and that means he has leadership, even though people don't, there's, there's, a, there's a trend now where you, we don't need leadership, we're all the same. But in God's pattern, he always had leadership. And worship in the Word. Isn't that good for everybody's church? Worship in the Word? But is that worship in the Word a reality of the Spirit, or are you just going through the motions? I had unsaved people come to my first church and go like this. You can imitate somebody else without having any reality, right? So what are the seven? One, those first three. Did I do that? No, I don't think I have it. But... It was under this one, isn't it? 
One, two, three, fears. We're going to deal with this now. We've got lots of time for ministry now because I talked fast, but not too fast, right? Honey? <laughs> now remember, the unknowable is going to battle with your mind. The uncontrollable is going to battle with your will. The unattainable is, is, is going to mess with your emotions. And what is the solution? We need the light of God's word, not our opinions. We need, we need the, uh, the life of God. And the life of God is nothing more than get out of the way. Quit controlling. It is God who is at work to will and to perform. Let him work. Let him perform. Or will you let him? And then the emotions, of course, is that God is love. He didn't just have love, he is love. And it's the proper motivation, the very nature of God. So these three attack the soul, mind, will, and emotions. Let's start with that one right now. And those of you watching by uh, video, right now, in the name of Jesus, I, I bring to the cross all of that extra flesh in me that insists on knowing something and gets all frustrated when I don't know. In Jesus' name. Let me give you an example of how that even works. Uh, as a, uh, a young Christian, I was looking for a route to this kind of frustration of having to know the answer. And God showed me that when I was in the fifth grade, I had a teacher that called my mother and wanted to know what was wrong with Dennis because when he sits in his chair, when he can't get an answer, he, sh he starts shuffling his feet. It's like, what's going on? I went, and after I was a Christian, I went and prayed, and that popped up. And guess what the root of that was? Not having the answer. I had uh, dreams, and I think I scared my mom of that. I had a dream, and I, I, I blurted it out without telling me, because I was talking real fast. They set me up with an appointment for an EEG. <laughs> In those days, I think they put the little Vaseline on your head and the little wires, and they told me to count back from 100, and I had me a minor panic attack. I must have been about 9, 10, I must have been a little over, about 10 or 11, and I had a mild panic attack going, if I miss a number, 100, 99, 98, if I miss a number, I'm going to be locked away, and they're going to say I'm crazy because they've got all these wires. And they didn't even tell me they were bringing me for what purpose. But I had scared them when I woke up out of that dream and was talking real fast. I think my mother was a little overly cautious there. But nonetheless, I got healed of that, of having to know and not getting frustrated with not knowing the answer because I got Jesus, and he is the answer. But I had to receive forgiveness for that, taking in that fear that I had to know. What if? What if? It really should have had no power. But my what if was, what if I miss a number? I'll be locked away. And it was like a panic attack. And when I receive forgiveness for that. So I want somebody, some of you, don't be a know-it-all. <laughs> know Jesus. All right, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, if there's a, an effort in me, a fleshy thing, to, uh, I demand to understand something rather than submit it to God and say, S teach me, O oh Lord, reveal it to me. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I receive forgiveness for taking in fear. And if you can show me the root to that, I want to know the root. I want to know where did that get started in my life? Secondly, the uncontrollable. How many have ever said at any point in your life, there's some of that fear in there. If I don't do it, it won't get done. I receive forgiveness. Lord, where did that come in? Did that come in with somewhere a long time ago? If so, I'm going to close that door. I receive forgiveness for saying, if I don't... If I don't do it, it doesn't get done. I'm always, oh yeah, that's a sign of emotional damage. I always or never do that. I never, I always. You're in control right there. 
What is it about I? It's about yielding to the Jesus in you. Let the peace of God rule, and then he's in control. Anything other than peace, I'm back in control. It's called stress in the business world, and they're even trying to sell it as a good thing. <laughs> yeah, a boss would sell you stress is good to get more work out of you. Then you go home and decompress and beat the wife. You know, it's like a lot of good that did, huh? Kick the dog and beat the wife, whatever. All right, the third one, unattainable. All right. I think the healthiest thing here, even, even in conjunction with the other ones, is you're never going to know everything. Resolve that. I may never know. Something that's going on in my life, I may never know. I receive forgiveness for that demand or expectation that I have to know. And it seems to be unattainable. Well, you know what? There's some things you're never going to get this side of heaven. But then there's other things that God says, I want you to search for me. Seek me, you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. But not out of frustration. Search me, not you. God searched, not self-searched. Big difference. Okay? That's the third one. Now we're ready for the fourth one. The performance trap. And really, the, the, the healthy truth there is, I want the standard of the cross, God. If I have some other standard of performance for myself, no matter how lofty I might think it is, if it's other than the cross of Jesus, I'm receiving forgiveness right now. I'm receiving forgiveness for having any standard other than the cross of Jesus. Your standard. I measure with a crooked stick. Your standard is the cross of Jesus, and it's totally sufficient, and it is not lacking anything. If I'm lacking, I'm going to go to the cross for the solution. The approval addict. The fear of rejection. I'm going to release forgiveness to everyone that I either perceived rejected me, and probably in a lot of cases you made it up. <laughs> Didn't even happen. That's just all your defense mechanism. But I release forgiveness to anyone that's rejected me. And if you were raised with a lot of rejection like I was, you release forgiveness to them. Because God ultimately had me pray for my father who only knew rejection of me. Even when my sister almost died of spinal meningitis, he says, why her? Why wasn't it him? <laughs> Would you call that rejection? Yeah. yeah. But you know the day came when I had him come forward with tears in his eyes to receive the acceptance that comes from God and God alone. Otherwise, you play the blame game. We know how healthy that is, right? So when I received, released forgiveness to him and I received forgiveness, see, I don't mess around. I'm not playing Christianity like that for the nicey-nicey churches who just want to make you feel good and entertain you. Right now, I want to destroy you. <laughs> I want to bring the work of the cross on you to such a degree that you go, ouch, that hurt, but oh, it felt so good after. That's what you need. Ow! Oh. You got to have the ah uh, after because that's the peace of God and the and that's the justification, the reconciliation, propitiation, and regeneration. I am what I am by the grace of God, and I like me. Did you know when I got healed of that, that, uh, that bedwetting thing and walking off the stage? I'm a baby Christian. You gotta give me a little slack. But they asked me again in, in a different church if I would give my testimony. And I went up, and I said, oh, I know this sounds crazy, but I felt like a cowboy in a saddle standing in front of a pulpit. Like, you belong. And I went, oh, I don't know how to say this, but I like me. And they, they roared, you know. Oh, well, we got a loose one here. He, li he likes himself. But I actually meant it in a healthy way. I just did not articulate it. Instead of being ashamed of me, I liked me. Okay? But it was, it was clearly in God. So, Father, we're just going to pray for all those that need that approval. You don't need that approval. You need God's approval. I release forgiveness to whosoever, and I receive 
Oh, and I love this. Drink in the acceptance that comes from God. You know, by the way, when I was re receiving the acceptance, there was an old commercial on television where this muscular, sweaty hand used to take a, a, a sledgehammer and pound something into the, into the concrete and it left a mark like on a tombstone or something like that. And I said, that's what God did. He put that, he engraved it on the tablet of my heart, and I am accepted in the beloved, and guess what? Nobody, even me, I can't, take, I can't erase it. I've got his acceptance. It was a gift to me, but I got it, and he engraved it on it, and so really, the other stuff doesn't much matter. I don't need the approval of certain people to feel good about myself. I need God's approval, and if I've got God's approval, then it's, it's, a, it's in their court. <laughs> The last one, or not the last one, but after the approval, the blame game, forgiveness. And the key with forgiveness, really, and we've done this throughout the whole church, is it has to be Matthew 18 from the heart. Oh, I've seen so many hurting people that forgive from the head, and they're sincere, but the only way you know if you forgave is when you do it through the new creation from your Bible heart, and it's you and Jesus joined together doing it, then it's the Jesus in you doing it. You will know because it changes to supernatural peace. That is the transaction. No peace. You were sincere. You didn't do it yet. If it doesn't change to God's peace, which means that's the culmination of my work. That's my assurance. That means I did it. And you don't have to try for a year to forgive somebody, for heaven's sakes. That's because you're sincere, but you're doing it from your head, no matter how sincere you are. When you do it from the heart and it changes to peace, nobody can erase that peace. You, have, you would have to throw it away and start over again on your own free will. But it's not going to go away. That peace will remain with you forever, and the enemy can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the last one, uh, the shame. Maybe my, some of my uh, stories of what I had to deal with to make this a reality, this teaching. Maybe this will work on you too. I am what I am. I cannot change. I'm hopeless. That's the way I saw myself when I walked off. Only I think mine was a little different. I walked off and said, you don't deserve this. So let's pray that right now. It's not about what you deserve. Thank God you didn't get what you deserve. You got his unmerited favor. <laughs> so thank you. Father, I just receive forgiveness for any shame that somehow I say that's the way I am. I'm not going to wear it. It is not a proper clothing. I am covered with the garment of the Lord Jesus, the armor of light. I put on the Lord Jesus, not shame. I command shame to lift right now in Jesus' name off of you. There's people watching right now where shame is coming off you. You receive forgiveness for taking it in, for blaming yourself, and then it lifts off you. It's a demonic hitchhiker. And this day we serve notice on that hitchhiker that you, your days are gone. I am not ashamed of me. I am not hopeless. I am not helpless. I am what I am by the grace of God. You see that grace of God right here? That's the regeneration. I am what I am by the grace of God. This grace was, it isn't it beautiful that God, without knowing all these different aspects of the cross, God gave me love, acceptance, and forgiveness was to be the atmosphere. And we have it on Tuesdays. We have that atmosphere. And it's conducive. God's created. And what will flow out in Ezekiel? What flows from the base of the temple? Living waters flow from the base of the temple. Wherever those living waters, there's health and healing go. So you have a mandate to be and to do and to reproduce according to kind. Amen? Amen. I have fun today. Did you have fun? You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.